The following lesson is linked to learning outcome four, language. It addresses the assessment standard that requires learners to use structurally sound sentences in a meaningful and functional manner. Learners should be able to use a range of figurative language such as idiom, idiomatic expressions and proverbs with developing appropriateness. Hi, I'm Charlotte. Thank you for joining me for this last lesson in our series on figurative language. In our lesson so far, we learned about different types of figurative language and how they affect our interpretation of texts. This is the more serious side of figurative language, as you will have to know the names and the functions of figures of speech in order to apply your knowledge when analyzing poems and set works. But today we are just going to play with English. The first figure of speech we are going to look at is the hyperbole. Please don't confuse this term with the one that you might know from your mathematical knowledge. This word has a very specific meaning in English. A hyperbole is an over-exaggeration and is not to be taken literally. In most cases, hyperbole is used to emphasize a point or to create humor. Now, I'm sure that most of you have used this line sometime in your life. But mom, I've got to go. Everyone will be at the party. I'm sure that upon closer investigation, your mother will find that not quite everyone was at the party. That was a very common example of a hyperbole. And so is this. So you guys, how is English today? It's terrible. We have a mountain of homework. Literally, it would be very ambitious to think that any teacher could dish out a mountain of homework. Don't you agree? This was another example of the hyperbole and should not be taken literally. The hyperbole was used to emphasize the amount of homework that was given. Now let's look at another example of the hyperbole. A few years ago, a washing powder ad aired on TV showing a housewife that tells that she nearly died when she saw the dirt and stains on her son's rugby kit. Clearly, dirty laundry is not life-threatening. She used this hyperbole to emphasize how horrified she was at trying to get the rugby kit clean. This advertisement was very successful because the viewers found the over-exaggeration amusing. Now let's move on to the next type of language I want to look at. Malapropism. Have you heard this term before? Malapropism is when a word is used incorrectly but sounds very similar to the correct word. The term malapropism is named after a character, Mrs. Malaprop, in a 1775 play called The Rivals, written by a man by the name of Sheridan. In this play, Mrs. Malaprop was a rather silly character that tried to impress people with her extensive vocabulary. Unfortunately, she used words incorrectly all the time, so all she achieved was to show her ignorance. The easiest way to understand malapropism is to look at some examples. Melinda suffers from very close veins in her legs. I'm sure that you will agree that having your veins very close to each other is not usually a problem. It is obvious that the word varicose should have been used instead of very close. Let's look at another example. Some people consider capital punishment a good detergent for crime. We know that the word detergent refers to cleaning liquid and that it has absolutely nothing to do with capital punishment, which refers to sentencing serious criminals to death. Clearly, the word detergent has been used out of context here and should be replaced with the word deterrent. That would mean something that discourages people from committing serious crimes. Now see if you can spot the malapropism in the next sentence. The difference between 10 cents and 10 rand is the dismal point. If you spotted that the word dismal was used out of context here, you are 100% right. Surely the sentence should read decimal point. If you can spot these kinds of mistakes or malapropisms, they are usually quite funny. 
Just make sure that you don't make them. Now let's look at another quirky aspect of the English language. Spoonerisms. Not only is this name amusing, but the application of it also usually leads to laughter. Now let's first see where this rather unusual name comes from. Spoonerism is named after the Reverend William Archibald Spooner, who was born in London in 1844. He became quite famous for his tongue getting tangled, and that is why the term bears his name. A spoonerism is the mixing up of the initial sounds of spoken words. Now let's look at one of Reverend Spooner's most famous spoonerisms. You have hissed my mystery lesson. Now, unless you have attended classes with Harry Potter at the Hogwarts School of Magic, I doubt that any of you have ever attended mystery lessons. Can you guess what the Reverend was actually trying to say? That's right. The Reverend meant to say, you have missed my history lesson. Do you see that the letters H and M were put in the wrong places and that this slip of the tongue conveyed a rather foolish message? Now, I doubt whether you will find spoonerisms in written text, unless the writer put it there for the reader's amusement. Now, I hope you are enjoying our rather fun look at English today. Now, the last puzzling concept I would like to look at is palindrome. Although this sounds complicated, it is really rather a simple concept. A palindrome is a word or group of words that communicates the same message when the letters are read backwards. Let's just look at some single words that are palindromes. If we look at these words carefully, they say the same thing whichever way they are read. If we look at the word civic and we start with the last letter and work our way backwards, you will see that once again we have spelt civic. There are lots of single words in English that are palindromes and I'm sure that you can think of a few more. The challenge lies in finding longer examples of palindromes such as this. You will notice that this reads sums are not set as a test on Erasmus. Whether you read it forwards or backwards, it still says the same thing. Here is another example of a longer palindrome. Madam, I'm Adam. This palindrome reads the same backwards and forwards. We just have to move the apostrophe when we change direction. I hope that you have enjoyed our rather light-hearted look at English today and it has been a pleasure to share these lessons on figurative language with you. See you again soon.